All right, we got a special summer off-season episode of View from the Rafters behind the scenes with the Boston Celtics, and we only do this when something pretty significant happens. I think we can say that the last 48 hours kind of qualify as that. No one knows that better than Brad Stevens, president of basketball operations for the Boston Celtics. Brad, I've asked you this in the past, but I think it's especially applicable after the last couple of days. How much have you slept? Huh, not much. <laughs> uh, you know, not much because you're doing, we got a lot to do. And, um, but, uh, and then also the emotional piece of it, right? How hard has that been? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always hard. It's, it's, um, you know, you're, we're, we're coming off of a, another, you know, season where we were really competitive and right there and right in the mix. And, um, you're balancing, you know, where you are in the big picture of your roster and, and what you need moving forward and how to best balance it out and make it the best it can be. And at the same time, with that comes some really hard decisions. They're, they're, those decisions are easy to have meetings about, but then to, to do it, to, to call it, um, and to um, you know get it done is, is much different. And the decision, obviously, that we're referencing right now is having to trade away Marcus Smart to be able to get someone who clearly you guys covered in Chris Des Porzingis. But let's, let's touch on that emotion and having to make that decision with Marcus. How have you kind of come to grips with that over the last couple of days since you made that decision? Yeah, I mean, and, you know, and, and Gallo and Muskie were in that trade, yep. too. And um, um, I would say that, obviously, Marcus being here um, for nine years, um, us drafting him, you know, um, and then me getting a chance to coach him for my last seven years, um, or my, yeah, for his first seven years was, you know, you know, an enjoyable journey. Um, and, um, he's a great competitor. Um, he's a really good player. Um, I've always appreciated his community work and, you know, the way that, um, the way that he's been to my kids and, and everybody else. So to say goodbye to, to somebody like that and to be the one that has to green light saying goodbye to somebody like that, um, you know, there's a lot of emotions involved. And uh, you said something interesting there at the start about how the season just ended. I mean, you guys were a win away from getting to the NBA Finals for the second straight year. I think a lot of people kind of get tunnel vision of the moment of last night and the, the draft and the trade happening, they forget what just happened a few weeks ago. How hard is that or was that to kind of like turn that page so quickly and be able to make such a critical decision regarding the future of the team here? I think we're, we're keeping the 10,000 foot view in mind as a front office all the time. Um, and the reality was is as, as, you know, as, as you look at our team um, and we had good depth and we had a really good team we were forced to play small more than maybe we would have liked. Um, and so as a result, we felt like it was better to balance our roster. And, and we knew that if we would have won or lost, right? Like it was just, it was kind of inevitable with, um, you know, with what our roster needs would be. Um, but certainly, you know, it still doesn't make it any easier because, you know, when you bring in someone of Chris Stapp's caliber, and you um, get draft compensation, yeah, it's you're, you're usually losing a you know pretty important part of your program. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Kristaps. I mean, he's a one-time All Star, had arguably his best season of his career last year. Clearly, you guys coveted him uh, in in some of these conversations. Why did you want to bring him in and add him to this group here moving forward? Um, I think the, the we we've talked about he can play with any of our bigs. Um, he can play the five as a standalone five. He can play with Robert Al as a four. And it's not crazy to think that he could steal a minute or two at the three because he can shoot so well. That's, That's not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. But it's not crazy. I'd love to see Yeah, it. it's not out of, you know, it's not, it's not crazy. Um, and as the game has gotten more spread out, you know, smaller and faster, I think the best teams have been able to maintain size while being able to defend both the three-point line and the rim. Our, our other bigs are very agile. Chris Stops is, is agile, um, but we should always have a deterrent at the rim now. Um, you know, when those, when two of them are in there together, you can kind of envision, you know, the lineups and things with 
you know, a couple of our wings and Chris Stapps and another big, like those, those are huge lineups. Um, and so those are, those are things that we're thinking about there. And he's excited. Um, you know, I think when you have a seven foot two guy, you know, you automatically think historically of, you know, in the paint, in the paint, and he's capable of doing things in the paint. And where I think his game has really improved is he attacks switches and really hurts them by posting. He just shoots over them. And, you know, and he- Kind of an element you guys haven't had a whole lot. Well, not many people have it. There's not many people that do it in an efficient clip. I mean, his post-ups last year were pretty ridiculous, the, the efficiency on them. And so it just gives you another option. And then you add in the fact that you can shoot from 25 feet quickly, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, it makes sense. So when I first heard about these rumblings going on, the first thing that went through my mind is you've said over and over since you moved into this position of president of basketball operations that every move that you make is in mind of trying to accentuate your best players. How does Chris Stapps accentuate your best players? Yeah, and that's that's... That's the challenge of this move because we know the other guy did. Right? Yeah. He did a good job and um, and and brought great you know tenacity to his work. Um, I think that Chris Stapps not only accentuates those guys; he can again, he can play with anyone. And so the ability to shoot and space the floor allows you to play and make everyone's life easier. Then, if teams can't switch us as much because he's making it harder to switch, then those guys have different places to attack, right? And so, you know, you're playing against a lot of teams with two through fours that are a little smaller and that can really get into people that are really tough to beat off the dribble. We saw that in the Miami series in a big way, really at one through fives. Um, and so to be able to take advantage of some of those defenses, particularly the switching defense, um, is really important. And I think that that helps. And then on the other end, you know, if you, if you get by a guy and Chris Stapps or Rob or Al or, you know, are at the rim, then all you have to do is run somewhere else to stay in the play, yeah. right? Because those guys will protect you. Seven foot six always seems to be there, right? That wingspan? Yeah. Is that what the wingspan I, is? I, that's what I I've seen, yeah. I guess I should probably know that. I just, I quit counting after seven two. That's good that's enough. That's pretty good, seven yeah. six. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate the toughness that Chris Stapps brings to the table because they think of him as kind of a finesse guy, but he, he's a tough player. But I think what, when people think about Marcus Smart, they think about toughness. They think yeah. about hard-nosed basketball. For everyone out there that might be thinking, well, what are the Celtics going to do here to address that area that there maybe is moving out the door with Marcus? What's your answer to that of like how, how yeah. is this team going to embody that, that toughness? There's a lot of ways to define toughness, right? Toughness obviously is diving on the floor or taking a charge or being physical. Toughness is also being able to go 23 and eight every night, like mm -hmm. Chris Stapps did. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in the NBA unless you're mentally tough, right? Um, we have a lot of guys that are that are mentally tough. We have a lot of guys that play physically tough. Um, and at the same time, we recognize like that was one of Smart's great traits. Um, that, and I thought always thought that Smart's instincts and feel for the game on both ends were were probably under discussed because people were more focused on him diving on the floor. Um, but uh, but yeah, we've got a lot of tough guys in our group, and that you know, and I haven't even mentioned like you know Malcolm and Derek and Peyton, um, you know, down the line. I'm not and Rob Williams and Al. Like we've got a lot of we've got a lot of good players, and I'm I'm worried mostly about how we can continue to improve and get better. And I feel like these guys are going to meet that challenge. You mentioned at the beginning, not only is Porzingis coming here, but you also get a couple first round picks in exchange or in that trade. Yeah. One of them last night, which is another part of the chaos, was number 25. And then it felt like you guys traded it about 100 times and moving back. How did that all unfold in, in moving from having the 25th pick and flipping that into what became five second rounders, including one last night. Well, we had a we had a list of about you know ten guys that we had been looking at at thirty five for the last month, and really kind of felt comfortable with that list. You know, obviously you always have your rankings, um, but you know the things you're weighing on the clock are okay. Do you want to pick somebody, or do you want to move back a little and get future assets? I mean, we've seen the value 
of second round picks, specifically at the trade deadline of being used in trades. And they're more valuable than ever. And to be quite candid, we were pretty bare. You know, I think we had one in 26 and one in 30 before last night. And now we go into the rest of the summer with six future second round picks. Um, and again, those are not, those are not like when I was a coach, I was like second round picks. You kidding me? I'm sure the fans are like, what the hell is he doing? But you can use those to move the needle. And that's all that we want to be able to do. And we feel like we're at a age and stage where we need to be able to balance having appropriate draft assets with chasing this thing. Uh -huh. And, um, and so we've got some, some ammunition to give us a chance to chase some things. Yeah, and you're talking about value, right? Like those second rounders have value. Yeah. How can it's, you explain how much more valuable those might be now heading into this new CBA yeah. than maybe what they were even a well, couple of years ago? There's a second ago. round exception that gives you some benefits in signing a player that, that, is, that it makes it more valuable. But I also just think, you know, it's, you know, anytime you're talking about draft picks, you're either slotted in the draft compensation in the first round or the second round is, you know, it's not going to be, um, huge high salaries that, you know, we all have to navigate with the second apron and all the limits it's going to put on us with regard to tools. Um, so I think that that's a, that's an important factor in all of this. Um, you know, and, and I didn't know if, if Jordan would still be there, but, um, we were hopeful. And so when we got a chance to move back once to 31 and get a couple future seconds and then do 34 and 39 and then 34 and 39 turned into two future seconds and we got 38 um and we got a chance to get a good player and a lot of assets my mind was spinning as this oh, was man. all going on i can't imagine how many phone calls you so guys are on trying so, to pull these you up. know i've never really once the second round started when i was coaching i'd laugh yeah. like i was just like whatever or i got ready to do media or maybe i just came down and then but like but, you know, yesterday, it's it's really interesting. You know, Mike and Austin and Dave Lewin and everybody or Remy Cofield are on the board, and they're just writing down every every offer you're getting for every pick. And then, you know, sometimes they go away because their guy's taken, and sometimes they last. And you have to make that decision on the fly. It's, it's pretty wild. So you wind up with Jordan. Let's talk about him. What, what does he bring to the table, and um, what should the Celtics fans be excited about to see uh, out of him during summer league? Yeah, I mean, I think the expectation for him it's going to be a journey. Like it's he's he is um, he's young, um, he's extremely, ath you know, athletic, long, tough. Um, he'll get into the ball. He'll um, he'll guard. Um, he's his body. He needs to work on his strength. He can get knocked off his spots on offense and defense right now. Um, and we really want him to believe in his shot. I, I thought he was. His shot selection was very conservative, and you know I think that's there's a really good part about that because that means you're playing to win, you're doing all the right things. But we want him to to really lean into the work that it takes because his touch is really good. Mm -hmm. When he came for his second draft workout, we did we always just have him shoot 100 spot threes, and you know he was in the 50s in May and he was 74 in late June. Wow! So um, that shows you that there's work being put in. And that shows you that, and, and you know, those are small samples. He'd probably be in the 60s sometimes and be 70s sometimes, but but it does show you that, you know, he's got the touch to become a good shooter, and we've got the time to invest in that. You wind up with him at, at 38. I just want to ask you about how you guys were moving back. Is he someone that you were eyeing maybe when you were at 34, and then you see, oh, he's still on the board. We might be able to still get he's, him at 38. He's, some, he's someone when we had 35 that we thought was there would be a realistic chance that he would fall to 35, that we had ranked higher than 35. Mm -hmm. And so when we were in the mid twenties, you're, you're weighing all the guys you're looking at there. And, and again, versus, you know, an unknown of what those second round picks can be used for. And so, um, and trying to, you're know, crossing your finger that you can get one of the guys that you're really targeting. So you get someone at 38 that you had ranked higher than 35. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but, you know, now that stuff's all meaningless, right? It's yep. time will tell, yep. right? It's yep. all, and we believe in Jordan. We think he'll do great. He's got um, a good support network, and, um, and you know, he's excited. You know, I, I think there's something, too. He came back here twice to work out. Like, that meant that he wanted to be here, too. Like, I, I think that that's an important quality. 
with his development, I think this is a great question to, or at least topic to talk about here. We've got a pretty significantly new coaching staff here that's coming into the team. What can we expect out of the way that this group is going to work on developing players? And I don't know how much it's going to change from the guys who are, have now moved on, but what do these new coaches bring to the table in terms of developing guys and Jordan being one of the guys that well, we're going to work on? Yeah, and we have a couple of um, staff that we've, you know, we're deep in the hiring process, but it's not official. And then we have Charles and Sam, who everybody's been talking about, that is official. Um, you know, I think Joe and, and those guys are all meeting about, you know, how do we want to play? Who's our assignments individually? Where are we going to go see players in July and August? What do we want to do to make sure that we're as prepared as possible and, and while learning each other? So I think there's a lot going on there, but um, he will be in a, in a place that will have all the resources to develop him well. Oh, we're looking forward to a check mark next to the draft, moving on to summer league coming up and free agency. We can't wait to see what you got in store for us in July. Appreciate you. Thanks, right. Mark. Thanks, Brett. Brett.